Ascension Kingdom Hospital medical staff. Attention. Everyone, please evacuate immediately. This is the big one. Get to safety before... Attention, St. Mary's Kingdom Hospital medical staff. Attention. Just checking in with everyone. Things are pretty solid for me. Have a great day. Enjoy that fresh morning air. This concludes your announcements. Stay tuned for feelings of resolution and a sense of fulfillment. This is Dairy Public Radio. Welcome back to Dairy Public Radio, a bi-weekly Stephen King book club podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Joshua Kahn, alongside CM Alexander. Hello, everyone. And one last time, sadly, there's just there's no Ben. No Ben. But instead, we have a special guest joining us. If you've come to any of our live events, you've seen this guy. He uh, runs the $1 Producer Project, and he's helped us put our screenings for movies together. Or if you haven't been to our physical gatherings and you've listened to our episode on 1408, this person played Mike Enslin in the audio recording that shook Ben to his core. Please welcome Anthony Natarelli. Hello. I forgot that I did that. (laughs) (laughs) You started talking about 1408. I'm like, yeah, I watched that and you're at your apartment or at your house with you. (laughs) I'm going to argue this is the real reason that Ben isn't here. That really bothered him. (laughs) That stuck with him for a while. And today we are covering episode 13 of Kingdom Hospital finale, and we have CM leading our discussion. CM, take it away. Thanks, Josh. First, our usual disclaimer, we are recording remotely during COVID, so things don't sound as awesome as we want them to. And Anthony, uh, to kick things off, I have a couple of questions to ask you, and your answer will determine whether or not you get to stay on this show for the rest of this episode. Every week, you're raising the stakes. <laughs> you know what? I, I'm fine with this being the shortest episode of Dairy Public Radio. So. First question. What was your first Stephen King experience? It was a short story that I read. I want to say I was in like sixth grade. And it was in like a magazine in, in our library. Like they did done uh, some like story about Stephen King. And they had some of his short stories in this article. And I don't remember what it was called. I barely remember what it was about. But I know that there was a mirror and I think it was in like a rainy attic or something. I don't know like any of the details (laughs) of this thing. I don't remember any of it, but I remember reading it and that, and I remember it was a Stephen King short story. Maybe it wasn't even that. Maybe it was someone else's like take on a Stephen King short story. I don't know, but I assume there was cocaine involved. (laughs) (laughs) I wonder if that was Secret Window. Could be. I don't know. Is that a, is Secret Window a short story? I haven't read secret window so unless i, I did <laughs> now i'll never know unless one of our listeners that sounds familiar to them fine if you guys find out if that was even a real thing let me know that's still an amazing first stephen king experience if if it's not real you just like hallucinated one <laughs> yeah i actually created stephen king oh, oh. Know this. makes a lot of sense what is your favorite stephen king moment this is dumb and you can't make fun of me for it the original it movie like tv series or whatever so that when the kid gets like comes out of the pipe with all the white hair and stuff and everything that scared the hell out of me i don't know why that was the moment in the movie nothing else in the movie bothered me. <laughs> but that scared the hell out of me and like to a point that i was afraid of billy idol for a while because <laughs> uh, I, I distinctly remember after that we uh, watching the wedding singer <laughs> and <laughs> And Billy Idol showed up and I like ran out of the room. <laughs> <laughs> just just sobbing. Yeah, I, I did not like Billy Idol because of that moment. <laughs> it, it, it's dumb, but that's the one. The thing the Stephen King moment that made me afraid of Billy Idol for a couple of years. <laughs> I love it. Well, hands down, I mean, that is the best answer we've had so far. And you definitely <laughs> advanced to the next stage. <laughs> yes! I did it. So last episode was bonkers in a great way. Uh, Steg and Mama broke up, and it was probably the roughest TV breakup that I've ever seen. (laughs) All of our sleepers and other key players are being gathered for the most important seance of Sally's career. Meanwhile, Paul has set Stegman into motion to kill. So we kick things off with this episode, again with our awesome narrator, who tells us that in about three hours at 11.47 p.m. KWT, which is Kingdom Weird Time, the end will come for the hospital and everyone in it. And we get a peek into the future and we see the earthquake hitting and we get this really cool gory moment where we're 
we're focused in on a clock and it's just like splattered with blood all of a sudden. And we see Mary in the reflection and she's ringing her bell. It was super cool. <laughs> <laughs> it was really cool, but it's it's a real foreshadowing cock tease. You know, I think we call foreshadowing cock tease delicious foreshadowing, Josh. <laughs> <laughs> because like... That's so cool and it's so scary. I was really hoping for a scarier finale. So right after this, everything stops and it rewinds and we see all of the damage being undone. And so we are back in present time. And Stegman and Richard have a hilarious run-in outside of the hospital. Richard is trying to warn Stegman, who thinks that Richard is one of them. (laughs) And suddenly Richard has these horrible vampire teeth (laughs) that we keep getting. And I feel like, (laughs) unless I've just blocked it out, has never been explained. I'm wondering if that is just a... An additional homage to the the spell book being a Salem's Lot reference. Possibly. That's that's the only explanation stylistically I can imagine why he would see them as vampires. I have nothing to offer as far as references to other books or anything because I <laughs> do not read. But I can say for sure, vampire teeth were never explained at any point except for like when Paul said they're all vampires or something. That was like the only point that I was like, oh, sure, now it's justified. <laughs> yeah, now... <laughs> So both he and Stegman are dealing with their own demons. Because the the <laughs> way they face off, Stegman is d- casually wielding his gun around, and he's stopped listening to what Richard said, and Richard is just talking to himself and is like, huh, maybe I should stop drinking, and then runs off into the night. That's right, yeah. They're, they're having a conversation at each other, not together. Yeah, but Stegman, I like that we start off this episode and Stegman is already completely unhinged and already scary in the first five minutes. I could not wait to see what he was going to do next. And unfortunately for Abel and Krista, Richard totally rats them out. What did you guys think about how many people are so willing to tell a guy with a gun waving around (laughs) like he's crazy where the people are that he's looking for? It bothered me a lot. Not not that they told him, because like I would understand a dude comes at you with a gun. You're probably gonna tell him if, what he's asking for. <laughs> or, or just but, like, lie. It's just so <laughs> casual. People are just like, oh yeah, they're that way, I think, is where I saw him. It's like, <laughs> clearly this guy is like gonna go do something. Do you not care at all about the other people that you you see on a daily basis? Yeah, they don't even warn anybody after he leaves. Yeah, well, they. to be fair, I thought about this too, but they can't call security because auto security. <laughs> Wait, is, that the, is yeah. that the explanation? Yeah, that's it. As because far as I'm auto? concerned, yeah. They, uh, the, all of these people want to report it to security, but Otto is with Abel and Krista. <laughs> and well, also, and, ba- and bad at his job. Oh, yeah, that's true. Well, Richard tries one last time to warn Stegman that the big one is coming, which leads to (laughs) my my favorite (laughs) moment, because Stegman points this gun right in Richard's face, and he declares, I'm the big one! And then he walks away, yelling about he's the big one. That's my favorite Stegman thing that has happened, is him (laughs) just referring to himself as the big one. This leads into the most brilliant scene of Kingdom Hospital so far. <laughs> Stegman is waiting for the elevator. And when it opens up, who is there? Oh, our lovely Brenda, who now looks 10 times crazier than she did last time we saw her. And she's holding a bunch of files. And uh, I'm assuming it's Steg's research. Mm-hmm. After she killed the rats, she took that. She throws it up in the air and then claws his face. But she she screams at him with this like primal amazing female rage. <laughs> I also- so I think that, that you're both missing what is my favorite part of that moment, which is when the door first opens and Steg just says, hey. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that is. Like, that is all that comes out of his mouth. <laughs> After everything that has gone down, just, hey, hey. You make it sound more innocent, Anthony, than I feel like he said it. <laughs> That that's what baffled me. Why I thought it was so good because like it was such like it it was such a calm way that he said it. Like it was he so wasn't casual. This monster. The last time they spoke. 
Oh, I loved it. And she tells him, so as she's scratching his face, she's like, here's a going away present from the pelvic equipped moving van. And then he screams and gets on the elevator yelling, Stag's the big one. (laughs) I also want to point out something that I think is hilarious. This incident never would have happened if Steg hadn't given Brenda his elevator key card. (laughs) Because then he would have used a totally different (laughs) elevator. (laughs) Now we cut to Sally and she starts to tell us Mary's story. And this is where we find out that the last episode of Kingdom Hospital is a fucking clip episode. Yeah. <laughs> I, that made me so mad. <laughs> that, that sigh is really, really all I, that needed. Okay, I'm sorry. My, it was just such a bummer. I have a bad history with clip episodes because you guys all know that I love Star Trek The Next Generation. And season two ends with a clip episode. And that was my first exposure, and I was so baffled. I was like, what the hell is going on? Why are they showing us things that aren't relevant and that I've already seen in seasons one and two? So then I started learning about clip episodes, and they usually happen when something not so great has happened to the production, when they don't know if there's going to be another season or something gets canceled, which I assume is what happened here because we know that Kingdom Hospital got canceled before they finished filming the episodes. But I still hate it. Well, and it makes sense because in the time when this was airing, like in when Star Trek was airing, people didn't necessarily like they didn't have DVRs Mm -hmm. necessarily and and people they didn't have reruns so accessible. There was no streaming. So if you had missed any episode like this clip show has clips from pretty much every episode. So if you'd missed a single episode, you missed something that was coming up in this. But for CM's sake and her sanity, I edited it to cut out all of the clip shows and it cut 10 minutes out of this episode. Well, I would have really appreciated that for, for my <laughs> that fantastic. I had to watch this as aired and it is rough. <laughs> yeah, I'm such a huge baby that Josh had to edit an episode for me. That's great. <laughs> All right. Between scenes we've already seen, Peter does some psychic light and reveals, you know, they're all gathered in the seance from the previous episode. He reveals Mary and Aunt Bear to the room of seancers. While Sally's talking about how everything's out of balance and that they need to do something, Mary creepily reaches for her bell. And okay, I'm sorry, this is kind of a tangent. I realized for the first time that if I was Mary and people could see me, I mean, like ongoing awesome prank right anytime you know (laughs) when you're walking down a hallway and you're both coming like and you try to do that thing where you try to step the other way but they step with you yeah that would be like me but with the bell i'd be like hey and i'd start reaching for the bell (laughs) you're a monster (laughs) so what you're saying is if you had a death bell you would be a bad person yeah (laughs) well i wouldn't actually ring it i just Act like I was going to. I feel like that's to. worse. So pretending you're always going to ring it feels like more torturous than just ringing it at that point. I, I'd just be a shitty ghost. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, there we go. The, my favorite <laughs> thing that Sally says here, though, is she is describing catching everybody to speed. And she says, ghosts are typically insane. We all understand that naturally. And I was like, we do? <laughs> what? We do all under, like, that's just a thing we all know. I, I think I learned that in third grade. That was in my science class. All ghosts are insane. <laughs> it was on a quiz. Yeah. <laughs> that's something that I ran into kind of throughout this series where it just kind of like, that's the most direct and like bluntly way that it puts it, but it just assumes that people are on board for a lot of stuff. Throughout <laughs> the whole show. <laughs> Let's do something amazing and cut to Stephen King. <laughs> the, the way this scene starts out, I got, ex- I got so incredibly excited at first. Not that I wasn't after anyway, but I thought that he was the fresh morning air spokesman. Oh my god! But it's a law a law firm commercial. That would have been amazing, right? Especially because Jesse James said that he had to send all those posters back if he Stephen King had been the guy on the posters. <laughs> <laughs> Did you recognize the commercial? We've seen this commercial before in Storm of the Century. Oh, I haven't seen that since it originally aired. Gotcha. So it's a blur. Yeah, this exact same commercial is played on a TV in nice. Storm of the Century. So that is why he is an attorney doing a commercial on TV, but then we cut to him and he's Johnny B. Good. That made me different. so happy. <laughs> How, okay, just, hold on a second though. Is he an attorney or is he a maintenance man? Or is he both? I think it's, I think he can be both. I mean, he's been gone all this whole time. So maybe that he was off 
lawyering some for some of that. It could be. Yeah. I mean, Aunt Bear's a judge and a lawyer. Oh, that's true. So Stephen King can be And a Paul. And a Paul. All right. You guys want to talk about the scene between Steg and Stephen King? <laughs> yes. I the the when Steg goes up to him and is he sh- like shakes his hand. He's like, very nice to meet you. And then he runs down all of the reasons he hasn't been here. Yeah. And like, <laughs> how was your teeth? How was jury duty? How was vacation? Uh, how was vacation? So great. But and then, he just blows off Stegman entirely. But then Stephen King rats out our seance group to Stegman. Yeah. Come on, King. That, I didn't like that at all. I was super bummed when that happened. I was like, you just, again, just immediately giving these guys up. Yeah. Especially knowing that he has one of those flyers that has Stegman's photo on it. Yeah, he right. pulls that out immediately afterwards. He's like, you're the one who needs a teeth cleaning or a vacation or something. <laughs> <laughs> I wish that's what he said. That would have been so much better. <laughs> <laughs> All right, back to clips. And we wrap up the Mo- Mona storyline, I guess. Th- this is as much as we get of Mona, which surprised me. What about you guys? Yeah, I was going to ask you guys about that because I didn't know because some of the beginning episodes is kind of blurred together in my head when I was trying to think back through it today. And I was like, maybe I just forgot some Mona stuff. So like, there's not a lot of Mona in this, right? It's she does the stuff with the wall and then we get that explained now and that's it, right? Is Basically. it explained now? Kind of. See, it's yeah. I I would agree. It's I still don't understand Mona. Right. That because that the line of dialogue that takes us to Mona is uh, Sally says Mona Klingerman helped me figure it out, and then it cuts to a, a clip that was the closing for one of the episodes. It was Mona having a seizure, and Mary's next to her, and that's yeah. when Mary like blows out the candle before the picture flies off the wall. Right. Yeah. But Sally wasn't there for that seizure. Sally doesn't know Mona was with Mary. Yeah, and I hope every time I have some weird medical thing happen, someone attributes something good happening to that. <laughs> like, oh, CM really helped me when she broke her arm. <laughs> yes. I will I will make sure to justify all of your future uh tragedies. <laughs> Jesus. <thanks. laughs> what are friends for? <laughs> Sally then goes on to explain very slowly that Mary (laughs) was the time girl at the mill and she was well loved and just what a freaking sweetie Mary is. And there's a scene it it happens a little bit, but I want to talk about it now because it's the cutest scene I've ever seen in my life. It's between Mary and a little boy who got pushed down and he was hurt and she's helping him. And they both, because they're child laborers, they have this like weird adultness about them, but they're so tiny and so innocent and they're still children and I actually teared up when I watched them hug each other. <laughs> <laughs> it is it is so emotional. It's so sad when he he says that he can't wait for lunch. And she says, are you hungry? And he goes, no, I always sleep at midnight lunch. Oh. And I was like, oh, oh God. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> That's when I knew that I was going to be be mad at this episode. Because like, I was like, you're going to make me meet some of these kids before you do this, aren't you? And I'm going to have to like... <laughs> connected to them in some way and we find out that these poor kids were working 16 hour shifts making uniforms for the soldiers and then when that was over you guys they only had to work 12 hour shifts easy breezy and we meet that's change right there baby (laughs) (laughs) we meet ebenezer gottreich he's the owner and he sucked (laughs) so hard (laughs) i kind of prefer him to the other Gottreichs we get, though. He's my favorite kind of evil. I thought you were going to say, he's my favorite Gottreich. <laughs> <laughs> he is my favorite Gottreich. Of the three that I have to choose from, he's my favorite. I was just about to give you shit for having a favorite kind of evil, and then I remembered all of our misery episodes. <laughs> <laughs> this guy realizes that the mill is worth more to him burned to the ground, and you know what else? So are the employees. At $75 a head. Which Yeah, I really didn't like when they put a price on it. Yeah. And, oh, man. But also, I didn't think about this. I didn't do the math on this, but he says it's $75 per kid, which in the end is going to total an extra $10,000. How many kids is that? Let me pull up the calculator, Josh. <laughs> All right. $10,000 divided by 75 per kid. Uh, well, it's not solid number. It's 133.33. So... They burned a third of a kid in there somewhere. (laughs) (laughs) Sounds right. 
So it's like 130 kids, r- roughly, is how many people <laughs> yeah, he has on the shift. Approximately 130. 130 kids. And I like I knew that a lot of kids died, but the, like knowing that that it was going to be that many was just an extra level of like, that's real fucked up over a hundred kids. Yeah. I don't think there's any justifiable number of kids. For, for this <laughs> scenario. You know, I'm going to come out and say that. <laughs> <laughs> this is why I hate Anthony. <laughs> Pays attention. I don't want to poke holes say. in your business plan there, Josh, but I'd say, <laughs> say zero burned kids is the, the correct number. Well, that's the ideal amount. See, Anthony, we're lucky that Josh works at a hospital and not a <laughs> mill. <laughs> <laughs> Sally also explains that the infirmary stands where the hospital now stands today. And it was run by Ebenezer's brother, Klaus, so Dr. Gottreich. It, it was basically a torture chamber, and the mill workers were his guinea pigs, which is e- extremely gross and sad. Okay, so this show is confusing enough. To add Please tell it, me you're about to mention the mustache. <laughs> no, no, not the mustache. <laughs> okay, sorry, uh, continue. It is the fact that as we're confused enough about time in this to have the actor who plays the Gottreich we've known all along also play Klaus Gottreich is very confusing. Right, because Dr. Gottreich is the son. Is the of, grandson. The grandson of Klaus right. Gottreich. And that's like thro- it's like thrown away in one line of dialogue. I mean, we know this because I read the book and mm-hmm. we talked about that got right. But otherwise, it's just like if you missed that line of dialogue, you'd be very confused. Like how old? Yeah, I just filed guy? that away under I'm dumb and I didn't figure this out. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that's not the only actor who plays a character playing another character. True. Because later when they're having a, a town meeting after everything burns down, there are reporters and also Peter Rickman drawing what's happening. I would have paid upwards of tens of dollars <laughs> if during that town meeting when we see Peter drawing a photo, drawing a sketch, because like right after it cuts away from him, it cuts to a guy taking a photograph. I would have loved it cut back to Peter and he was like, motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> I, was real angry about I, would, I, I would have loved it. Like it would have lo- completely killed the tension, but I yeah. would have thought it was great. We get briefly interrupted when Otto, Abel, and Krista arrive to the sleep lab, and they can also see Mary, and they seem like they're all old friends. Yeah. And they're like, they're petting Ant Bear, which, thank you, somebody finally pet that guy. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how you can be in a room with an animal and not pet it. And she pets him behind the ears, which is where Mary said he likes to be pet. Yeah. That's where he likes to be, be scratched. And Abel looks over very meaningfully, I think, at Sally, and he says, we're going to make things better if... Sally, there's enough time. Hint, hint. <laughs> Pick up the pace. He's, he's telling her to stop clip showing and get to the point. Yes. That's... Which she does. I really appreciate the, putting that in the dialogue for us. Yeah. yeah. Like, don't worry. We're almost out of this. <laughs> now we see what happened to Mary. We, we see that after that exchange with that little boy, uh, she catches Ebenezer and Mr. Haggerty. Or Irishy McIrish, because he's just and he's just a walking Irish stereotype is <laughs> what this character is. But his name is Mr. Haggerty. She spies them starting the fire, and uh, Antipas shows up for the first time and tells her that she's the witness and she must see it. She must see it very well. They start a fire. For some reason, Haggerty can't manage to grab a hat that a small child grabs minutes later with no problem. But his mom gave it to him, and so that's why Mary runs in and grabs it. And for some reason, a ghost door slams shut. Yeah, that's not. I wasn't sure why. Maybe the pressure from the oxygen bringing up in the thing. I don't know. I mean, maybe, but also ghost door. I think ghost door is the correct answer. It was one of the few parts of the clip show that I actually I liked the way that it, it it set up kind of what we get to see later. Like they with them hearing the bell, her going back and to get the hat, and like how like. It actually, it's the only part of like the whole flashback that I felt was necessary for us, like understanding how these things act later and like why what happens happens. My problem with a lot of the this whole flashback sequence is that it's it's all stuff that we've kind of been able to piece together throughout mm-hmm. the whole series. And but this is like the one moment where we get to to see the stuff that we aren't clear on, like things that actually play out later and matter to the story 
I liked this part of it more than I liked anything else that, that we saw, like basically throughout the entire episode up to this point, after <laughs> we started the seance to here, I was pretty checked out for most of it. <laughs> but like getting to see, see how this plays out actually mattered. And I, I enjoyed getting to like actually experience that part of it and understand what happens later with Mary. It was a bold move that they later use a clip from like 10 minutes earlier. <laughs> yeah. I was going to talk about that when we move forward. Oh, like, yeah. The fact that it's a clip show that uses clips from the clip show episode. Can I ask you guys, which is more evil? The fact that Ebenezer stood there on the other side of the door, watching through the little window, watching the kids bang on the door or the fact that he turned around and started singing a lullaby to Mr. Haggerty while it was happening. Josh, I'm- you just paused so oddly after watching the kids bang on the door (laughs) (laughs) that I don't know what you said after that can you you repeat to be fair it's king so yeah I I said which is more evil the fact that Ebenezer was staring through that play the the screen in the door watching all the kids bang on the door trying to get free or the fact that Mr. Haggerty was pulling away from him and he pulled him back and started singing a lullaby. Uh, well, I hate singing, so I'm going to go with that. <laughs> yeah, I I I would have to agree that any any lullabying is I almost immediately assume there's some evil behind it. I <laughs> refuse to accept that it's any in any way pure. That's fair. But especially lullabies to a grown man. You're <laughs> evil. So as they can't get out from the locked door, uh, everybody's panicking and Mary turns and Antibus is there. He guides her to that opening in the floor so they can escape. Something I wanted to point out, obviously, Antibus looks this way. We discover because of Paul. Mm-hmm. But the fact that Paul and Mary hadn't met yet, I'm assuming that he looks like this because this is this is also not just a flashback to the audience. These visions are being transmitted into the heads of the people in the seance. Antipas Mm -hmm. is like zapping them with these memories so they can see how it played out. And I assume he just looks like that for ease of convenience for all the people in the vision. Everybody's not like, wait, who's that guy? (laughs) Which, which leads me to ask, do you think that Antipas looked like the Anubis that we think of? When he first met Mary, which is partially what leads her to that name misunderstanding, because she would have seen him with the jackal face. I would hope so, because I don't think at this point Paul has been born. Yeah, Paul Paul won't be born for another like 50 years, yeah, 50 years. <laughs> and maybe that's what his necklace is supposed to represent for the audience. Sure. A, it's a small detail, but it still would have made more sense to know that that's not what he looked like when they first met. Yeah. Antipas actually reveals himself to all of the kids because he has to physically open the door and they all have to run around him to get into these tunnels. And uh, he joins Mary running at the head of the group. She turns around just in time to hear an explosion and a wall of fire just tears through all of the kids who've been running to safety. She asks Antipas, why didn't you save them? And he says, because I could only save you. Which also makes me want to know, how long did he know he could only save Mary? That d- uh, That's not like, sorry, I tried. It's a flat response. I could only save you. So that seems sort of cruel. Because well, we get a little of his cruel side mm-hmm. in this episode. Going to your question, I want to tie the next scene in with that because I think maybe we could figure this out. Because we, we cut from that back to the seance. And Sally accuses Aunt Paul of using Mary. And he says, she does me a solid. And Peter finishes, you do her a solid, which I don't understand. What did she or will she do for him that he needed to use her? But then he's going to do her a solid? Yeah, the exchange of solids uh, in that (laughs) relationship is much harder to follow. Peter and Anubis, it's easy to see where those solids are Mm -hmm. uh, throughout the series. But like this one, I'm still struggling really to figure out what she does that's necessary after. Because like the being used thing, I I, I figure like that's the going back with the, the hat and everything. And then, but like, I don't see what that does to help Anubis. 
that's where some of my confusion comes into this. Yeah, because she... Sorry we know, if I'm jumping forward a little no, bit. No, you're fine. We know that she's the source of the issues with Swedenborg in space and time and everything. Ant Bear did that to her. He made the situation happen. Right. But now he's trying to stop it. Why? <laughs> <laughs> Excellent question. Like a bunch of time goes by and he's like, oh, I really screwed up this plan, didn't I? <laughs> it's like, I gotta get me a new Mary. <laughs> it's like, this would have been fine. But then uh, with the original Kingdom Hospital was built and then that was a shit show. And he's like, oh, now there's too many dead people. <laughs> this is just one major catastrophe too many. I do want to point out here because it just popped in my head when you mentioned the hospital. A, re- a character that we do never wrap up Ghost Ambulance. Nope. Ghost Ambulance is just around. Yeah. Yeah. I thought I had it figured out. And then I was like, I'm completely wrong. That's not even because I thought that it was the, the, the tortury doctor whose name I can't pull out of my, my got right now. Yeah. So I thought that it was him just cause like you would, you would see that the ghost ambulance and then you would see him sometimes throughout. And I was like, Oh, that's it. And then like it showed him in context of like when he, when he's from I'm like, Nope, that doesn't fit. <laughs> <laughs> So some mysteries will just never be solved, I guess. Last thing before we clear out of the tunnel that everybody who has watched this along with us and has been a guest on the show has messaged me about this one scene. And that's the scene where they make their introductions. And Mary asks what his name is. He says, I'm Anubis. And she says, Antibus? Immediately after. No. No. (laughs) <laughs> no, uh-uh. I messaged you as soon as I finished watching yep. that, that part today. No, I will not accept it. That's unacceptable. You can't just add T's. That's not how you mispronounce stuff. And like they even say at one point that like the reason that, that they explain something with like how he looks or something. I don't remember exactly what the line is, but like they acknowledge the misunderstanding of like why we know him as Antipas and stuff mm-hmm. before he, that introduction happens. And I was like, okay, what's going to happen? Like, and then they show it. And I'm like, that's your explanation for this random T just showing up in a name. I will not accept it. I'm like <laughs> viscerally angry about how dumb that is. It would have made sense if one of two things had happened or if both had happened. If we had seen him with his original face and seen the, that she could confuse a jackal and an anteater. Sure. Or if he'd introduced himself as Anubis, and then she had not said his name right back because then there's some commotion that goes on and she turns and he's gone and she yells his name out searching for him and then she would have said it because the way she says it right then, he could have just been like no, it's not how you pronounce it, but if he was gone then that misunderstanding could go You know what though, I kind of get it because a lot of people will just butcher my name (laughs) and sometimes I've (laughs) simply given up and I'm like, yep yeah, that's it. <laughs> like, this was one time. It was one time. And like this, this, the reason I think it makes me so mad is because the setting that you're in, what happens right around this introduction? There's a goddamn explosion. <laughs> Have them say the name as an explosion happens. And then... Who, who knows what she heard? Yeah. That's Whatever she says, that's his name after Did they that. have this exchange before or after the explosion? I'm trying just to remember. After, it was just after the oh, explosion. Oh, so maybe her ears were ringing, Anthony. Tinnitus. Yeah. It was the tinnitus. That's what we said in the text messages, yep. too. We didn't combine it with the actual explosion that had just happened. <laughs> that's so. true. That's true. We assumed she had tinnitus from ringing her bell so much. Oh, my so God, much. you guys. But an yeah. explosion uh, in a cl- enclosed tunnel makes way more sense for getting tinnitus. I suppose that could. Adorable. Yeah. <laughs> But, you know, if that's the case, you should have been like, I don't know, like holding her ears or something. Sure. <laughs> really <laughs> give me a reason to believe that she's not just dumb. Oh. Speaking of dumb, Stegman finds Gupta. God, did I say it right? Yeah, you did. Whoo, I'm not a Stegman. And he's still waving around his gun. And despite this, seeing that he has a gun and that he seems even more nuts than usual, he's like, oh, yeah, I saw Otto take Abel and Krista down that way, right over there, go over there, and then proceeds to follow Stegman for a ways and continue to engage him with comments. It's like, <laughs> okay, if you are scared and you're just trying to get rid of the crazy guy with a gun, don't then follow him out to the hall and continue to talk to him. I wish he would have just turned on the MRI and let the gun just magnetically uh, fly into the machine. I thought for sure that was going to happen, and I was so on board for it, and then it didn't. 
that exchange was one of the weirder ones to me. He comes he comes out of the MRI room and goes into like the uh, the tech- technical booth or the control room. I don't know what they call it. I'm not a doctor. And he like he even says like I I'd be more comfortable talking if I didn't have a gun in my face or whatever. And he puts the gun away and then tells him where they went and immediately the gun is back at him. <laughs> and he's like, this seems like a man I should follow and say some more things to, to right. before I turn around and say, I'm going home. <laughs> I, my, my favorite part of that exchange was the fact that he's like, they went down to the labs and he's like, there's a, do- there's a dozen labs, including my own. And Doug Gupta goes, I don't see how that's my fault. <laughs> <laughs> We cut back to the old town and Ebenezer is making a speech about how much it sucks that the mill burned down and the people died. And Klaus has the biggest boner for all of this. (laughs) And we get some, like I said, we get some cameos. Um, Peter is in this. Liz, the nurse, is in it, right? It is. Mm -hmm, Yeah. I also think Dr. Havens is one of the townspeople also. Oh, yeah. I think we saw that too. So they are still looking for Mary. And this whole time... During this press conference, we hear people screaming from inside the infirmary. And then Ebenezer blames the fire on the kids, saying one of them must have been smoking. Which is, of course, against mill policy. Of but course. kids being kids, love to light up them cigarettes in <sighs> a tiny room. At the end of, well, Man, at the end of a 12-hour shift, sometimes you just have to smoke in a closet. Sometimes midnight lunch hits and you just got to hit that closet for a quick break. <laughs> but that's the thing. That's why he's my favorite kind of evil is he starts talking about these things and Haggerty and Klaus are watching and somebody asks him a question and Haggerty's like, oh, oh and Klaus is like, no, my my brother is going to handle this because he's a pro. And then you just watch him like like a snake just play on all of this expected grief he has. And then because they know they think that Mary's a witness, he says that they're offering a a reward for anybody who can find her because they want to make sure she's safe. And Klaus is like, ah, you son of a bitch. (laughs) Klaus uses a a very specific term, uh, like phrase when he describes his brother there. And I think it it applies very well to some of the, the characters that we even see in like the present time in the, in the show. He says he's he's very cozy with the devil, is the way he describes it. Yeah, I really like that turn of phrase <laughs> a lot, and I felt like it fit really well with some of the people that we've seen throughout the show as well. Even like how their their judgments have worked out with Anubis and things, kind of like tied into that mm-hmm. too for me. And I really liked that. Absolutely. So I just wanted to make sure that that phrase got said because it's a very very good <laughs> phrase. It is really good. I also want to give props to the way this town looks. I thought the design was really cool. Yeah. It's very drab and kind of gritty and depressing. It's... I just assume that that is what the past is. <laughs> <laughs> Everything kind of monochrome. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's sepia and dusty. Poor Mary, though, walks right into the bear trap because she's got the hat and she's going to give it to its rightful owner. And so she walks right up to the infirmary and they bring her inside and they start questioning her. And she tells them that she didn't see the fire. Nobody started the fire. She doesn't know what they're talking about. And we cut back to Sally and she explains that they didn't kill Mary right away. And that's why we have these newspaper clippings. So they kept her alive for at least 10 days, I think. Yeah. Yep. It's because, so we find out that the Gottreich that that we know, the Dr. Gottreich that has been throughout the show is obsessed with lobotomizing. That's his big thing. Well, the implication here is that Klaus Gottreich is inventing the lobotomy. He mm-hmm. pulls out uh, his lobotomy tool that he invented, and he's explaining to Haggerty that while he's trying to cure pain, that memory is stored very near the same place that pain is in the brain. How he assumes this, <laughs> I have no idea. But he he says, what I'll do is I'll, this will be a perfect experiment to see if I can, I can just erase her memory And she'll just have these little scars. And so I'll cure her of pain forever and I'll erase her memory of this and it'll be great. And then Haggerty suddenly is like, I have a conscience now (laughs) hurting a little hurting one single little girl. That's madness for not even seventy (laughs) five (laughs) dollars. Oh, God. That's the problem. He didn't he didn't put a price yeah, on it. There was no. no money involved. That's what the, <laughs> the issue was. I do love that if you need to like 
have some sort of ridiculous medical procedure in you, whatever fiction you're writing, just set it in the past when medicine was just, ah, I don't know, we're going to try it. Because <laughs> you don't even need to justify how he thought that was going to work. It's not, no one knew anything about the brain. Throw some needles in there and see what happens. Yeah, just poke <laughs> around. Uh, just poke around. Jeez. So we're going to cut back to Stegman for a minute, who's still looking for a crew, despite being told by literally everyone he runs into exactly where they are. And Nurse Carrie sees him with the gun and faints. Classic Nurse Carrie. Oh, and- I love Carrie's fainting. <laughs> it's so great. It's my favorite. And we are back in the seance room, and they are all going to get drugged up so that they can share a dream together. And Peter dreams of a fire hydrant. And I poked fun at this last time, but I looked it up. And I guess fire hydrants were invented in 1801. So Mary probably does know what they are. What? Why are you looking at me that way? Uh, I, I'm, to be fair, I'm looking at you the same way from my apartment. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm just curious why that, because he's he's not chasing after an old timey fire extinguisher. He's chasing after the one that when he was being wheeled there, they went past it and Mary told him to see it, see it very well. Right. So it's, I just was confused well, no, why the I, invention of it was well, an important timestamp. Because I wondered how she knew what that thing was. Oh. Okay, okay but also, what, what year was the, the mill fire again? 1860-something, I think. Yeah. 1869. Never mind then. Well, no, well, I'm going to come <laughs> back to that. Well, I'm going to bring that back up later. All um, right. We can keep moving. I am too. Oh. Yeah. So, oh, oh, God, you guys. It's just my favorite part in the world. I'm so glad we get more of this. Elmer is in the machine and <laughs> oh Lona, my God. Lona turns him on so that he can ah. <laughs> drag, <laughs> drag just her naked body to Old Kingdom. But wait, no, I was confused. It was a clip of that scene. <laughs> so I was like, wait a minute. They were all supposed to go, but somehow Elmer managed to drag just Lona there naked. And I was really disgusted <laughs> and impressed with him. <laughs> I wish that it would have been that scene where she's naked and then all of them would have just come through the door. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this was the moment in, in the episode where I like audibly was just like, oh my God, <laughs> with the clips. Oh, because we get both of the, the clips yeah, of them. We get both of them for no reason. Yeah. Well, it's, and, and again, it's because the show thinks you need, it pointed out to you again that Elmer's the catalyst that lets them do it. So they could show you the second time it happened, which is the more succinct one. But that clip starts with her saying this again. And so though someone's like, no, 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 we got to show both so that we know it's happened before. Otherwise her saying <laughs> really again, doesn't it. make any sense. I just thought it was unnecessary. Am I allowed to swear on this show? Yeah. Yeah. I didn't think that we needed to go through Captain Dreamfuck twice. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Oh. Well, fortunately, this is all broken up by Stegman trying to come into the sleep lab, but everyone has vampire teeth. <laughs> so he pee backs out and Sally summons Mary and we cut to Mary's brutal death. She's basically like double ice picked right in the face. He's telling her, got rights like, what is your problem? You shouldn't be feeling pain and screaming and fear and gets so angry. Yeah. He just, just slams him right into her skull and presumably kills her. It's horrible. Oh, it's absolutely terrible. Yeah. And it- I don't think it's presumably at that point. I think, <laughs> I think we're all on board that she is done. At that yeah. Point. Uh, and outside the lab, Stegman is still there. And our other Dr. Gottreich and Paul are are giving him a pep talk. They're giving him the courage to burst back in there. And when he does burst back in there, the I know I've already said the best thing happens, but the best thing happens. Uh, the the seance has started, and um, the floor bursts open, and a bone nado in white light comes pouring out of it. And Steg rushes in with his gun, just rushes into the middle of the group. And just takes a turn pointing it at everybody. And then Antipas just bites his fucking hand off. It's amazing. Didn't and see that. And it's so smooth. Yeah. yeah. Like, just nails it. <laughs> oh, oh, it felt good. So everyone but Natalie, Bobby, Otto, Lona, and Elmer's dad, whose name I still can't remember, disappear. <laughs> they are in the Old Kingdom. And th- so Stegman 
is freaking out and he's with them and he's trying to punch Dr. Hook and can't because he doesn't have a hand. <laughs> and <laughs> he's just so off the walls here. I love it. Sally yells at him and he turns around and hisses at her like he that, has vampire teeth. That hiss was <laughs> awesome. It was beautiful. It was so good. And it, it seemed like right afterwards, like he had startled himself. Like, oh, I didn't know I had that hiss in me. <laughs> well, while we're at this particular point of him because it's when he hisses at Sally that made me think about this. So we've talked before that Kingdom Hospital was shot like a movie. So they shot everything. They shot set by set. So everything that happens in the old kingdom right there was all booked together. Mm-hmm. Imagine all of the things that have happened happened to Stegman that Bruce Davison had to keep track of. Yeah. For all of the <laughs> like in shooting out of order I imagine he had to be like, how insane am I on a scale of one to 10 at this point? Solid 10. Let's do this. And then he hisses. So maybe, yeah, maybe after that, he was like, oh, yeah, I nailed it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. the What happens right after that when he just goes and like sits down and tries to go to sleep? That was just the actor being like, no, I'm done. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. <laughs> it's not getting better than that, guys. <laughs> I, I also like, and I think this is Abel and Chris is doing, that his stump it's not like a bloody stump. It's 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 like uh you know sewn up and, yeah. and all nice, but it does have a stamp, and the stamp says "hand goes here." And as soon as he sees that, he's like, "Oh, I'm dreaming." And fortunately, everyone is like, "Yeah, sure, go take a nap." Mm-hmm. Uh, there's more to that stamp. It says the full description of the stamp says "hand goes here" if you're a good boy. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> I, I missed that because I was watching it's, the YouTube edit. It's, so, it's so tiny. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't read it either. Yeah, I, so I, I'm glad that you you pulled yes. that up. Oh. I, I had to know. Very important question for you guys. Mm-hmm. As as Elmer gets sidetracked, would either of you drink an Old Kingdom Nazala? God no. <laughs> Wouldn't it be? I mean, everything down there is dead. Wouldn't it just be flat? I just wanted to know what that flavor is. <laughs> <laughs> I saw that yeah. machine, and that is my first thought was, what what flavor is that? <laughs> I just wanted to know. I assume it's just like a cola, is my See, guess. See, I feel like it's got too cool of a name to just be a regular old oh, cola. That, yeah. I feel like it's got to be at least like a Dr. Pepper spinoff type thing. There we go. Cola there's, adjacent. There's 24 flavors. The 24th <laughs> flavor is death. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I would also, I, I thought this was going to be a uh, a Langoliers reference. Yeah. Yeah, I thought that he was going to get the the pop and it was going to come out and he was going to pop yeah. and it was going to be flat. Uh, and I thought that would, that was a, a, a subtle nod to Langoliers. My gosh. But then, yeah, then there was no meatballs. So is, is Langoliers in Swedenborgian space? <gasps> Maybe. I have it on VHS. Right <laughs> We're going to watch this next. I have been actively avoiding saying that this whole show because I know that I'm not going to say it right. So Langoliers? I'm just not. No, Swedenborgian. Oh, yeah, uh, Swedenborgian. All the I, things, you know, <laughs> that's what I was worried about. I don't even no, know if I'm saying it right. Swedenborgian. <laughs> Good job. All right, Peter finds his favorite drawing tool and he draws an arrow on the wall and then says, I guess this is the way we're supposed to go. So did he draw that arrow with his own free will? And I imagine him kind of side glancing at everyone. <laughs> like, did they see me do that? Hey, guys, we should go this way. Or did something compel him to draw it? And that's how he knew that was the right direction. It's probably answer B, but I want it to be answer A. Like nobody's taking charge. So he's just like, ah, fuck it. This way. (laughs) That's how I get myself out of like the woods when I'm lost. Yeah. I just draw arrows the direction I want to (laughs) go. Well, and Peter has had so much agency up to this point. (laughs) 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 Oh, God, Uh, that's. A very painfully accurate. <laughs> so we keep clipping during the scene to the scenes where Stegman is an old kingdom. It's very confusing. And so we're just going to move past it because our crew is now finding themselves in the pain wing. Then we clip to Frankie and the baseball player while Sally is explaining that their souls are trapped here in Sweden- Swedenborgian space, the pain room. And I would have liked this better if they were... If there was an extended scene that we haven't already seen for this, instead of just showing us everything again. I feel like what they were trying to do is like give us reference for like where we are at as like, oh, we've seen this place before. This is where we are type thing. But like it's done so poorly through through the editing and like how they use the clips that it just breaks it up into an like it's more disorienting having it there than if we just kept going. 
Yeah. And then the next scene would have set that up because they find a baseball. So we would have made that connection. Right. And it says, good luck on it. And we're going to talk about this at the end because of a very important question for you guys about this. So put a pin in it for now. All right. The crew find themselves in the mill and they are seeing, this is what we were talking about earlier, Anthony, they're seeing the scene from the mill that we just saw. Yes. Could we have just seen this once right here? Yes. And that's my issue with this entire episode is there is so much of this whole story that could have been broken up as we're going through it. And we could have seen these things play out in pieces throughout instead of taking the first half of the episode and making it this big storytelling flashback sequence that we then have to go back to reference because we took too long the first time and it's too far into the beginning of the episode now. This is all Sally's fault. Yeah, it's Sally being a shitty storyteller. (laughs) why this episode sucks. She's a psychic, not a bard. (laughs) So after all that nonsense, Aunt Paul appears and he tells the crew that they are witnesses and they have to save Mary. Let's talk about how they save Mary because they go into the room that's on fire. They go into the room, they play Dragon Tattoo, which really hypes everybody up. Yep. And that's how they save the world. No. No? Uh, that's where <laughs> red, I turned it off. Red, red Dragon so. Tattoo didn't I, save the day? I th- I think you're missing a, a very imp- important part. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. The, for some reason, we get another what I thought was going to be a clip show, but it isn't a clip show because it's the same scenes from the very first episode of Peter going on his jog, but with the dialogue changed. The, the main one being his uh, Natalie getting out of the shower and saying, hey, don't forget your chalk. And he goes, don't worry, it'll show up. It's an anteater thing. And then it's so it, weird. It's so weird. And then it shows Antibus. That's he, apparently so weird that my brain erased it. I don't remember <laughs> that happening. <laughs> Antibus, and then it shows him after the van hits him, Antibus dropping that red chalk in his hand. And then it all comes to Peter that this is what he's here for. This is drawing is what's solid for Peter. So Peter takes the chalk and he draws a fire extinguisher on the wall. You know what he should have drawn? Ebenezer. Oh. And Gottreich with a fucking heart. <laughs> Just, so love is the answer. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Huh, okay. Uh, wouldn't wouldn't it have been so much more satisfying if Kingdom Hospital after 15 hours ended like the Grinch who stole Christmas? <laughs> <laughs> okay. What what would the title of that movie be? All the Who's down in Swedenborgian space. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. <laughs> so yeah, Peter decides. Oh, Mary was telling me to make note of a fire hydrant. That's how I can get us out of this. I will draw a fire hydrant on the wall and then extinguisher. Or- <laughs> <laughs> Not a full fire hydrant. <laughs> probably would have worked better. Probably would have yeah, worked because then they could have opened it. More yeah, they could have opened it and just yeah. left. Okay, so he draws a fire extinguisher and he's going to will it into existence. Except he can't <laughs> nope. really. But so Abel and Krista actually have to help him make make that happen and then hook grabs it and he puts out the fire and this part is really cool i love that they had hook grab it because aunt paul tells him good job dr hook next time you look at your graveyard remember what you did here i thought that was a really solid final note to put on hook's character should just ended the episode right there everyone wakes up back in new kingdom and peter is up and walking and he's okay and stegman also wakes up and he has both of his hands which i wish they wouldn't have done it would have been bold and cool to keep him one-handed but he in swedenborgian space's defense he just went to sleep he was a very good boy (laughs) i guess that's true (laughs) i guess having not been able to read the whole stamp before it makes sense that he gets his hand back but i was also like incredibly disappointed oh uh, yeah that, that he got his hand back so i was like this dude has been nothing but a bad dude the entire time and, and he, he can't gets hurt people in anymore the end. if he doesn't have his hand to do surgery people right. would be right. safe and like the last thing that he did before this happens was go into a room fully intending on shooting people right yeah so sally sees the newspaper clippings except now they've changed Uh, Mary survived. The paper shows that a mystery object was also found, (laughs) and it's a picture of the fire hydrant, which was already invented. So is this another, like, King moment? Like, the Heimlich maneuver and (laughs) pick locks? Yep. (laughs) Sweet. Okay. 
And of course, Jesse James shows up to give everyone a button for Operation Morning Air, which is awesome. I love it. He's so positive. <laughs> Everything seems okay. There's there's no earthquake damage in the hospital. Nurse Carrie faints when she sees Peter is up and walking. Um, <laughs> that is great. One also, last faint. <laughs> they also see a portrait of Mary in the hospital, and they find out that she lived to be 91, and this is her hospital. And Sally tells them that Gottreich and Paul are gone, and they don't have to worry about them anymore. And they're walking out of the hospital talking about this, and they're all going to get a drink together, and it's very, very cool. And we cut up to Stegman's office, and he's watching them through his office window. And Gottreich and Paul are right there with him, and they all do the kingdom finger. And that's where the episode ends. Please don't ever say kingdom finger again. <laughs> that's what it's called, yeah. Anthony. I don't like it. I don't, uh, but I don't. Also, that is not the la- that's not the end, though. <laughs> the last frame is not that. The last frame is very creepy and I don't like it at all. And it's what I, because they do like the, they, they show Stegman's office with, with them and it like pans over and you see in the, the sky and like Mary's face shows up for like a second <laughs> yeah! and then it fades out. That's and it's so weird. The, it's, I it doesn't didn't look good. I see that. I didn't see that at, really? Yeah. Yeah. There's like a last pan over before the episode's done and it shows her face in the sky and it looks terrifying. <laughs> I, I must have blocked that out. Okay. W- w- as we wrap this up, I have a question for you guys about time and the baseball guy. So they reset time for him and he became the mayor and caught the ball and all of that. So now that they've reset time again, does that undo what they did to his timeline? Did he miss the ball again and end up committing suicide? It is. It's entirely possible. So, so that's what's kind of weird about how everything ends with this episode is that obviously they change time because we see that Mary, Mary's portraits in the hospital and everything. And we, we see that she lived to be 91. But like nothing else has changed, like all the way up to like even Peter's state that everyone expects him to be in is the same. You would think that because, you know, the, the time travel rules that most things go by, like you go back and change that. So like then Peter would have never actually been in there. All that hoopla mm-hmm. that we could go through forever. It, it doesn't seem like anything else happened other than than showing that Mary was the one who, who founded the hospital and everything. Like it doesn't seem like any any other like drastic changes happened after the events of that day. Yeah. And so, it's a, it's weird. I don't it's it, it's kind of unsettling. It's also weird that Mary founded the hospital as a little girl. <laughs> yeah, it was a, it was a weird choice to have it be a portrait of her as a child. <laughs> yeah, because nobody does that. You wouldn't be the founder of this great thing. Like, you know what? Hold on. I don't want me as I am now. I don't even want me when I was like smoking hot 21 year old. I want eight year old me. But it says on that plaque before it says founder of St. Mary's Kingdom Hospital, it says the savior of Lingby Road. So maybe that's why it's her at that age, because that's when she... All this fine print. All the, exactly. Yeah. Josh, Sorry. how you quit reading shit? Okay, <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay so here, I, I have a theory that can explain this. So we established the first time we do time travel, which is with Candleton, that everything changed, but everybody who was involved in the incident remembers. Okay. Because Rickman and Mary, after they go back, everybody else remembers him winning the World Series, and Mm -hmm. and that's all it is. But they remember. So the fact that they were all a part of this time reset, including Mary, means that they all carry over all of the memories, including Candleton, so he would still make his catch. So, but I I take issue with that, though. Because, so, so in, like, the situation with number 11... He, so it goes back, like, like you said, like everyone directly involved remembers, but like everyone that was wa- like listening to the game at the hospital, like, watching the game at the hospital, just remembers the new timeline. They don't remember the old timeline at all. So the fact that they come out of this and Peter is fine and everyone in the hospital is reacting as if he shouldn't be shows that they still know he was there the whole time in the state that he was in. So if they've gone back and changed time, then like how it doesn't have a branching effect across all of their timelines. It's only Mary's timeline that is is affected at all. And obviously like the kids and the fire. I guess we shouldn't scoff at saving a hundred children. <laughs> and losing ten thousand dollars. <laughs> but this also it's kind of fuzzy the first time we do the time travel because when that timeline resets all of the people who were in the mri room 
are still in the MRI room and they wouldn't have been there mm-hmm. without Candleton. Right. They're all there, but he's not but there. He's but not. They don't, they're not like, where's Candleton? They're right. Just like, they don't Why remember. Are we in here? Right. Mm-hmm. So there are, uh, there are some fuzzy rules. Maybe it takes a while to catch up. And after they leave the hospital, <laughs> nurse Carrie and the orderlies won't. It's won't like remember waves. Of how it yeah. Yeah, yeah. I got it. It is. We talked about paradoxes. This is the kingdom hospital paradox. There it is. Also, I want to point out that everybody is shocked when they see Peter walking, except for Jesse James. <laughs> Jesse James gives yeah. him a pin and doesn't bat an eye that he's up and walking around. Well, and I tried to think about it, and I couldn't think of a time in the show that they've been in the same room up to that point. Episode one. Is he ever in the room with him? He's talking to Natalie, but I don't know if he goes in there. Because I don't think that Jesse James has ever actually interacted with Peter. <laughs> All right, uh, that brings us to the end of not just this finale episode, but to the end of Kingdom Hospital. We have spent 15 hours painstakingly uh, going through Kingdom Hospital, and it was so much fun to do. But it is time now to get to our final ratings. Uh, I will go ahead and kick things off. Spending so much time with Kingdom Hospital has been so great. But, you know, we, we've ha- obviously had our complaints. We've had those episodes that didn't make a lot of sense, that felt like filler. Uh, so that brings it down a little bit for me. But I think because of how much I have just enjoyed it, like I've watched every episode at least three times, once for the show, once to make my notes, and then once with my wife. So I've thoroughly enjoyed it. So I'm going to give it four out of five blue chambray shirts. CM? For everything it does that bothered me, it does two things that I absolutely love. And so I'm going to have to give Kingdom Hospital five out of five blue chambray shirts. Oh, shit. Anthony. Okay. So uh, I feel like you guys are going to be upset with me. Um, but for there, I have a lot of issues with the show. It exists in my least favorite era of media, probably, really. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm going to have to give it like 2.5 out of five blue chambray shirts. Your rating is your rating, man. Yeah, man. Do You do you. I mean, we'll never have you back. So <laughs> if you're okay with that. I don't that. even want to come back. <laughs> what What makes it a 2.5 instead of a 3? That that comes down to like just little little things with like production value stuff. There's a lot of like, obviously like early CGI stuff isn't very good, especially on the TV side of things. There's a lot of really not great acting and performances in this show. There's a lot of things that just kind of pushed me out of it at a lot of points, especially early on before the story really got me in. And because the three of us were not the only ones who watched this entire series, we are going to also check in with the blue chambray shirt ratings for all of the guests we've had for Kingdom Hospital. First up, Paul Workman. Like I said, I love trash. It's five out of five blue chambray shirts. Nick Hofer. I give it three and a half blue chambray shirts. While it's not a particularly good show, I did enjoy it. Jess White. Overall, I'm going to give Kingdom Hospital four out of five blue chambray shirts. I thought that even though it's kind of bonkers and the show is all over the place and the rules keep changing, I just, I like Antibus enough to give it four out of five blue chambray shirts. Lisa Khan. I would give Kingdom Hospital four out of five blue chambray shirts, only because there were some loose ends and I would love to see a season two to see how all of that stuff wraps up. Steve Jennings. All right, so this whole show seemed like Stephen King doing a parody of himself. With that said, there was about half of it that I liked and half of it that I didn't really care for. Some of the bad stuff I thought was at least funny, so I enjoyed it a little bit. But going just based off that I liked half of it, I didn't like the other half, I'm going to give it exactly... 2.5 2.5 chambray shirts so two shirts and one shirt just ripped in half by an ant bear jeremy marr i enjoy the themes and mythological references in the show and the performances of andrew mccarthy and bruce davison are quite good but the series has very slow pacing and very low stakes which makes it feel like the protagonist's success in the final episode is inevitable the inconsistent tone never builds the themes to a satisfying story or it doesn't go far enough to carry it to the profound absurdity of uh, david lynch and i'm sure anything seeming to indicate a subtext of civil 
civil rights struggle is purely coincidental. I'm being very generous in giving Kingdom Hospital two out of five blue chambray work shirts. Black Lives Matter. That's it for this episode of Dairy Public Radio. As always, thank you for listening. Join us for our next episode where we are back to books. We'll be covering Tommyknockers Part 1, which is covering all of Book 1. And guess what? Ben's going to be back! Yay! For CM Alexander and Anthony Natarelli, I'm Joshua Kahn reminding you, time is nature's way of keeping everything from happening at once. Hey everyone, Sam Alexander here. Thank you for listening to the final episode of Kingdom Hospital. We hope you enjoyed it. Special thank you again to all of our amazing guests, Paul Workman, Jess White, Nick Hofer, Lisa Kahn, Steve Jennings, Jeremy Marr, and Anthony Natarelli. As always, you can find us on social media at Dairy Public Radio or send us an email at dairypublicradio at gmail.com. Check out our website, constantreaders.org, for everything Stephen King and Stephen King adjacent. And if you haven't already, please take a moment to rate and review us on iTunes so that other people can find us. Before I let you go, there's just one more thing we want to share with you. Paul Workman was kind enough to give us a Drinking Age movies style review of Kingdom Hospital. You'll find the full review at the end of this outro. That's all for now, listeners. Goodbye. Hello, Constant Readers. This is Paul Workman from Drinking Age Movies. And don't worry, I don't have a long list of trivia to bore you with today. Instead, I have a review to bore you with because Josh and CM were kind enough to ask me to give a review on Kingdom Hospital. And I'll say that if any of you listen to my show, Drinking Age Movies, you will know that I love trash. I love things that just swing for the fences and miss so wide that it's amazing that they got made in the first place. And that's kind of Kingdom Hospital. It sits in that Judge Dredd uh, cats zone for me where it seems like a good idea. Maybe it wasn't. But nonetheless, I like that it tries for a dark humor. I like that it tries for some outright horror. I love that it goes for some deep drama. And a lot of times it's missing, but it's in the most spectacular way that you can miss any of those things. But a lot of times it does hit, and when it hits, it's really, really good. And I will say that I especially love the Butterfingers episode that I got to review uh, on this show, Dairy Public Radio. Uh, this It's a fun show. I think Bruce Davidson's wonderful. I think Andrew McCarthy knocks it out of the park. Uh, I think the cast really works well together, even if sometimes they're being made to do some of the goofiest stuff imaginable. I don't know. I, I get a little forgiving with television before what we call the golden age of television when uh, HBO really started inspiring uh, more high-class uh, scripted dramas. And I don't know. I, I think they tried really well. I think uh, the director kind of holds it back. If you've ever seen any of his stuff, it, it doesn't always work. But nonetheless... I love this show. From the bottom of my heart, I love it. I, I can recognize all of its flaws and still think it's massively incredible to watch. It was a fun ride. I'm glad Josh and CM and Ben were wonderful enough to introduce me to this show, and I will thank them forever for it. So thank you, everyone. <laughs> <laughs>